bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome day that you've given us, the beauty that we are seeing in this hill country that we call home, Father. Lord, I ask you to be with those that are here today. I ask you to open their hearts, their minds, their eyes, and their ears. And let them receive the words that you have chosen to share today, Father. For those that aren't with us, I ask that you bring them back safely next week, Father, that, that I speak blessings upon their families. I speak health into their families. Lord, we know that there are many that, that need prayer today for healing. And specifically, Father God, I call out Renee to you today. Lord, this woman has been in ICU on, on a ventilator for the last month. And Father, her family needs her. And we just ask for Renee's healing, your divine intervention, Father God. I ask that you do that today, Father, to show yourself. Lord, we have Jennifer and her family that need your prayers today, Lord. We have Donna and her family that need your prayers. We ask you to lift them up, Lord Jesus, and all that you can do to be with them, to comfort them, and to show them your majesty because you are the great healer. Lord, I just, again, thank you for this day. If you would, please just continue to watch over us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, watch your eyes as Karen um, turns on those lights and Rebecca makes her way up here to give you some announcements. Good morning, good morning. We're so glad y'all are here. Happy early Valentine's Day to you. Please feel loved and know that Transformation Church loves you with all of our hearts. And we're so glad that you choose to be here every Sunday or as often as you can. Just a few announcements. If you feel compelled to give, you are welcome to give in person right by the door in that basket. You can give online at findtransformation.com slash giving. You can text the word transformation to 830-293-4483, or you can also give on our app. If you haven't yet checked into Facebook yet, please do that, because when you check into Facebook, all of your friends see that you are here and they think you're a pretty awesome person, so they might want to come and join you too next Sunday. So if you have not checked in, go like you're making a post. You can scroll down to check in and click on the Transformation Church at the 125 Lehman location. We are happy to pray with you at any time. Uh, we just prayed together as a church, and Dad made that known um, for certain prayer requests that we have for people. If you want to put somebody on a prayer list, we are happy to do that. Maybe James needs to be put on the prayer list. He's struggling with the slides today. That's okay. Um, <laughs> we are happy to pray with you, though, in person, or if you want to just text the prayer, um, or if you want to write it on the transformation card um, on the back. There's a prayer request part of that right outside the door. If you don't have our app yet, make sure to go to Google, uh, the Google Play or App Store and search for Church by Ministry One. Once you have it downloaded, you can search for Transformation Church Kerrville and you'll have access to sermons, contact, you can sign up for Freedom Class if, when we have that or different things that we have got going on. You can also submit your prayer request there. And I'm going to toss it over to Dad now for how much is enough? Toss it over to dad. Jeez. Um, I want to say something about prayer. And, and it hit me really hard this week. And I just want you to understand this. When you're asked by someone to say a prayer for them or to pray for them, don't do it just once. You can pray for them right then if you choose to. But put them on your list. Keep a prayer list and continue to pray for those people until you hear otherwise. The reason I say that is if we look at what King David did when his son was stricken and was dying, King David prayed solidly. He prayed. He didn't eat. He didn't do anything but pray. And once the Lord took his son home, King David got up, washed himself, and then ate. That's what prayer is about. I'm not telling you to stop your life and stop going to work. I'm just saying keep that prayer in front of you because prayer works and prayer matters. Okay? All right, thanks. All right, so last week we celebrated our first anniversary as a church. And I started the message and I said that there were two things that I wanted to talk to you and share with you last week, but we ran out of time. So today I'm going to share that second thing with you. And I'm glad that we ran out of time because you'd have been here till 3 o'clock in the afternoon last week if we'd have kept going. So this week, here's what I want to share is how much is enough? How much
much of what, you might be asking? Well, how much is enough TV? How much is enough toys? How much is enough food? How much is enough study of the word? How much is enough fill in the blank? In order to answer the question, how much is enough? One must first ask the question as to what the purpose for the accumulation is. The second thing one must realize and fully understand is that no matter what the purpose, God owns it all. And this is hard. No, it's extremely difficult for most people, especially Christians, to understand. This is what causes people to place others ahead of God, to place things ahead of God, to place money ahead of God. So today, I want to talk about how much is enough in three areas of your life. And we all have them. Idols, possessions, and money. So let's look at number one first. Idols. What is an idol? Okay. An idol can be anything that we think we need to make our lives better happier, and to give our life meaning. An idol is not just a gold image or a false god as they appeared in the Old Testament. An idol could be a person, an idea, or a concept. Perhaps it's your husband or your wife who you depend on to fulfill your needs when they were never intended to fulfill those broken parts of you, and you've put them in place of God. Maybe your idol is social media, your phone, apps that you, that you play, or you look at for hours, day in and day out, or rather spending time talking to God. Perhaps your idol looks like an addiction to the gym because you just can't sleep until you have that perfect body. Or maybe your idol is the child that God finally gave you after being barren for many, many years. Let me tell you a story about a man and a woman who tried year after year after year to conceive a child, and they were unable to conceive. The woman was so upset for her husband that she gave him her employee to see if she could bear him a child, and she did. Then one day they had some visitors show up at their place, and one of the guests told the man that, hey, your wife's going to conceive a child, and in fact, Next year, when I come back to see you, she will have that baby with her. The man's wife overheard the conversation in the other room, and she let out an audible laugh. The guest immediately asked the man, why did your wife laugh? Does she not believe that it can be done? When confronted, the woman lied and said, I didn't laugh. But the guest said, yes, yes, you did. I'm sure by now some of you already know, I'm talking about Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was 99 years old when the guests arrived at his home, and he welcomed his son Isaac into the world when he was 100 years of age. Sarah wasn't much younger, but she was far out of normal childbearing years. So let's look at the whole backstory so that you can understand this and it gives you a little more context. If we look at Genesis 17, 1 through 8, it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, for I have made you a father of many nations. I skipped the whole line. Sorry about that. He called him Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. 
the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So Abraham is 99 years old, and he has one child that was born through his servant or his wife's servant, Hagar. But then Sarah, he and Sarah had none of their own. But God says in verse 2 that he will greatly increase in numbers. Then he follows that up in verse 4 with the covenant for Abraham, telling him that he will be the father of many nations. Fast forward a year. Sarah has the child, names him Isaac, which, by the way, means laughter. Abraham is over the moon. He loves Isaac so much, and he wants Isaac to be everything that God said he would be, so he sends away Hagar and Ishmael. At this time, Ishmael is about 14 years old. It upset Abraham that he sent his son away, but God reminded him in Genesis 21, 13, that he would make him into a nation also because he was Abraham's offspring. Side note, this nation that was created through Ishmael is still around today. It's called the nation of Islam. But that's for a whole nother message. All right. Abraham so loved Isaac that he sent away his other son. Why? So that he could devote more time and energy towards Isaac. Abraham, in a sense of the definition, was making Isaac an idol. Can you see that? And we know what God thinks of idols. So what does God do? when he thinks that Abraham is idolizing Isaac. If you'll turn your Bibles a few pages to Genesis 22, 1 through 12, we see what it says. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied, that God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said, Father, and, and, well, sorry, spoke up to his father Abraham. He said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So here's what I see. God tells Abraham that even in your old age, I'm going to give you and make you a father of many nations. I'm going to give you a son. And he does. Abraham starts to idolize this boy, and God doesn't like that much, so he's going to test Abraham's faith. He tells him to sacrifice his only son. What about Ishmael? He tells him to sacrifice his only son, and Abraham is going to go through with it, and God stops him short. I don't know if God was planning the whole time 
to stop Abraham. But I do know that Abraham didn't worry about whether he would or he wouldn't. Even though Abraham idolized his son, he had faith that God would either spare his life or resurrect him from the dead. Ask me how I know this. Come on. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. I know this because Abraham had this much faith because of a two-letter word. And often people miss this. Two letters in and of itself don't make any, any sense. They don't mean anything. W and E. Together, they spell we. We, you, me, me, you, God, me, me and God, God and you, you and God, Abraham and Isaac, Isaac and God, Isaac and Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, we. Abraham said, we will come back to you. Look again at Genesis 22, 5. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham was willing to give up his idol knowing that God had a plan. Abraham was willing to kill his own son knowing that God had a plan. What idol do you have in your life that you can give up because you know God has a plan? Abraham gave it all. And scriptures go on to say that he would be blessed by God and his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. His descendants would take possessions of the cities and their enemies. And through his offspring, all nations on earth would be blessed. Not some. God used the word all. Allow God to show you what you have been worshiping that is not him. So that he can heal you and bless you. Number two, how much is enough? Possessions. If you'll turn to Luke 18, 18 through 30. It says a certain ruler, which some versions say a certain church leader or a certain church official. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this then asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible for man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brother or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Okay. Some will read this verse, some in the church will read this verse, and they'll say that we're not supposed to have possessions. We're supposed to be like Jesus, sell what we have, give to the poor, then we can be a follower of Jesus. I think there are a few things in this verse that deal with possessions, and Jesus explains it, we just have to see it. 
We have to look at this in the context. Because remember, words truly mean everything. If you remember the word we. First, what is the man asking? He's asking about how to get eternal life. He thinks it's his stuff is the key to eternal life. You and I know that our stuff has nothing to do with eternal life. It's believing that Jesus is who he says he is. The man asked what he had to do. Jesus, in turn, played with him, telling him that he had to follow the commandments, and if that was not enough, he had to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. You see, Jesus knew the only thing he had to do was believe in him. Yet since this man lived by the hundreds of man-made rules, Jesus spoke in a rules-based language for him to understand. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging here. Jesus talked about a camel going through the eye of the needle as being easier than a rich man getting into heaven. Then his disciples quickly chimed in and asked, who then can be saved? Okay, let's set the record straight. Jesus was not talking about a literal gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle that camels would have to squish through to get in. I've checked, I've rechecked the evidence. There is no proof that there was ever such a gate. The idea of Jesus talking about, though, a small gate that was very difficult to get through was quite convenient for us. It means that though it's not easy, and you may have to unload a few things along the way, it's possible to get into the kingdom if you're willing to make the necessary sacrifices. But that's not Jesus' actual point here. He meant to say what he he meant what he said. He was being facetious with this boy. He was being somewhat humorous. The thought of a camel going through the eye of a needle is preposterous. There's no way that could ever happen. It's impossible. Hmm. Do you see that? If you do, then you have his point. It's like an elephant springboarding into a cup of water, like a giraffe doing a limbo under a three-foot-high stick, or like a Clydesdale getting into the driver's seat of a smart car. Get it? It's humor. It's not possible for a rich man to save himself. That was the point Jesus was making. In fact, it's not possible for any man to save himself, rich or poor. You can't make enough sacrifices. You can't unload enough baggage to squeeze in. The disciples understood precisely what this meant. That's why they immediately asked, who then? Can be saved. Jesus' answer implies that it takes the working of a divine miracle for a sinner to make it into heaven. We call this miracle the new birth. Impossible with man, but possible with God. The gospel of Jesus Christ declares that salvation is a miraculous act of God. That is why he gets all the glory. So instead of trying to work your way into the kingdom, trust in this miracle working God who sent his son to redeem us and his spirit to convert us. It has nothing to do with possessions. Number three, money. How much money do you need? The answer to that question is normally, by the way, as much as I can get. You've heard that, right? Okay. Just so you know, that's not the right answer. Okay. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever said it? I know there was a time in my life I did. Again, we have to go back to the beginning and ask the question, what is the purpose for the accumulation. However, before you can answer that, you have to decide 
whose money is it? Is it yours or is it God's? Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. There's that word again, everything. So if scripture says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, that would kind of mean money, possessions, things that we think we own. God owns it all. Reading this makes me believe that it all belongs to God. Everything we have, nothing without him, nothing. He provides all that we have or all that we need. Church, there are over two thousand scripture verses that deal with money that's more than any other single subject in the bible including salvation why because god knew that the enemy was full of pride and jealousy and that he would do everything in his power to see that we as children of god would be full of the same pride jealousy Satan plays on our greed, our desire to be more, to have more. And he does this so that we don't have to rely on God. That's hard for the United States Christian to do. You go to a third world country, they are so dependent on God. But we have so much to take for granted in the United States that we think we are in control. Church, we are not. And the sooner you can realize that, oh my gosh, the blessings that can come. If Psalm 24.1 is true, then what Satan is selling is a lie. God owns it all. Everything you have, your hopes, your dreams, your stuff, and your children. I shared earlier how the words we use are important. What if we truly believed Psalm 24, 1, and we all were in agreement that God owned it all, it all belongs to him, and ask him instead to show you how he wants you to steward what he gives us. So what does being a steward mean? What exactly is stewardship? Webster's Dictionary says stewardship is defined as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Has your children been entrusted to your care? How about your job? How about your money? How about your possessions? God gives you these things to steward. He trusts you with these things. So if God owns it all and he has allowed you to have it, ask yourself, are you being the steward that he wants you to be? Philosopher Francis Bacon said that money is a great servant, but a bad master. In other words, is money serving you or are you serving money? Okay, I need to ask you a few questions to gauge your faith, if you will. Question one, do you believe that God is the same today as he was at the beginning of time? Yes or no? Yes. Number two, do you believe that every word in the Bible is true? Yes or no? Number three, do you believe that what God promises will come to pass? Yes. Number four, do you believe that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. All right, so if you've stuck, me, stuck with me this far, here's the final question. Do you truly tithe?
The average tax bracket in the United States of America is 24.57%, roughly one quarter of a person's income. God teaches us about tithing, which is 10% of a person's income. Literally, the word itself in Hebrew means 10. Now, this topic is extremely hard for pastors to preach on because most people think all the pastor cares about is the money. Let me explain something to you. God doesn't need the money. He doesn't need your money. He already owns it all. The Bible tells us that tithing is a way to show that we trust God with our lives and our finances. Again, tithing isn't for God's benefit. He doesn't need our money. But instead, tithing is meant for our benefit because sacrificing a portion of our income reminds us to rely on God to meet our needs. Supporting the work of the local church is one of the main purposes of tithing. Tithing helps us to actively help others. Christian author and speaker Dave Ramsey believes that between 75 and 90% of the Christians who go to church do not truly tithe. 75 to 90%. Everyone's familiar with Dave Ramsey, right? He's the financial guru in the Christian world. I believe he's right. I've seen it in our churches in America because if they did, the church would be able to do its job, taking care of the needy, the widows, and the orphans. And guess what? We would not need a welfare system. The church could do the job it was designed to do. Giving encourages a grateful and generous spirit, and it can help steer us away from being greedy or loving money. In Exodus 17, 7, the Israelite people tested God by asking Moses, is the Lord among us or not? God did not like that. He did not like being tested. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6, 16, he says to the people, do not Put the Lord your God to the test as you did in Massa. That was 17.7, the previous verse we just shared. That's where they tested God and he tells them, do not test me. Church, God does not want to be tested. Except. Except in the offering of tithes. Malachi 3, 8 through 12 says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are you robbing me? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Then God continues and says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. Church, it gets better than that. Continue on with verse 11. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be delightful. You will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Almighty. Tithes and offerings. Giving 10% of your first fruits, the only thing in Scripture that God says to test Him with. Now, here at Transformation, we do what's called transformation tracks. And we haven't done one in a while because most of you have taken it, but we're going to start them up again very soon. The very first transformation track is about our church, our beliefs, our values our structure, and our budget. If you have not taken the class, like I said, we're going to start them up again soon. The one thing that I share in the first class is that I will not 
be a pastor that stands up here talking about money and tithing from the pulpit every six weeks. I've committed to one time a year. Unfortunately for you, that's today. This is our new year. In fact, I never talked about it last year at all. I don't think that's my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to teach you what's right and what's wrong. Our message today is not about the money. Our message is to share with you sound biblical doctrine that we can all put into practice to experience God, for some, in a new way. For others, we get to experience him in deeper ways. Do I believe in tithing? Yes. Let me share my personal experience on tithing with you. Karen and I have always been givers to the church. We were not tithers. You see, we pledged, we gave, we thought we were doing what we were supposed to do. I always thought that the Old Testament was history and it wasn't important. Nowhere in the New Testament can I find Jesus saying anything about giving 10%. But you remember my questions, right? Did he come to abolish the law or fulfill it? So coming to fulfill it means it doesn't change what was written. We paid our bills. We were never late. We lived paycheck to paycheck. We didn't go on many vacations and my kids didn't have all the fancy stuff that some kids have today, right? But you were always taken care of, were you not? I discovered that the history of the Old Testament was still the word of God. The living, breathing word of God. What he said in the Old Testament was meant for today as well as then. God will never change. I came to the realization about six years ago. And Karen and I started to truly tithe. I'm saying this not to brag. Please understand that. This is my testimony on how it works. It's not about us at all. It's about God's word and trusting that his word is true. Test me in this, he said. And test him, we did. This was not to get more stuff. I've heard it preached. If you want more things, just give more. That's not it, folks. This is a biblical principle. God's math is better than any math I've ever seen in my life. But it's not about the stuff. We didn't believe in giving to get mentality. We do believe in biblical principles. Let me share with you that over the last six years, we have given back to God over $125,000. And that doesn't include the gifts to nonprofits that we support as well. Tithes, offerings. What we learned, however, is the blessings that we receive are not just monetary. In fact, one year, things were really tight. We continued to tithe, and it was really tight financially. But at the end of the year, we look back on our blessings and our oldest daughter moved back home to Kerrville. That's a blessing, folks. We thought she'd stay gone forever. Another year, things were tight again. And that's when Rebecca met James. What a blessing for our family. He has been. You see, most people, when they test God through tithing, all they're looking for is more money. This past week, Karen and I went out to dinner three times. Two of those times, someone else paid for our meal. Why? It happens time and time again. Remain faithful and blessings are there. Are your eyes open? Are your hearts receptive? Can you see? changes that happen. 
Friends, it's not about the money and it never has been. Tithe, true tithing is a matter of obedience. And when you are obedient, God opens the floodgates of heaven. Do you have to tithe? Well, tithing your income is biblical. That's what it says. But you're not a bad Christian if you don't. God loves you even if you don't tithe. Remember, tithing isn't a way to earn God's love. We already have it. I'm just sharing a biblical principle that works. Has everyone ever heard of the Tide Pod Challenge? You know, when those kids were being stupid and eating Tide Pods, the laundry detergent? I want to introduce you to something that we're starting here at Transformation. And it's called the Truly Tithe Challenge. This is a 90-day, no-risk challenge for you. Again, God tells us to test him in this and see if he will not open the floodgates of heaven. We believe his word is true. So I want you to go home and I want you to pray. If you are not truly tithing, I want you to pray about this challenge. And as I explain the rest of it, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Read the scriptures and see for yourself that God has not changed. Here's how it works. If you choose to participate, we ask that for 90 days, you truly tithe 10% of your first fruits to the church. Paychecks, gifts you receive, whatever is a first fruit. So if you lent money to someone and they pay you back, that's not a first fruit. Just saying. We believe that you will see God in a new way. We believe that God will show you blessings that you have never seen before. We believe that you will start a habit that will no longer be a hindrance and you will continue to tithe for the rest of your lives. Not for any other reason, but the joy that it brings to you. So this is how the No Risk Challenge works. We are so certain that God will be faithful that our commitment to you is this. If you truly tithe for three months and you don't see God's blessings in your life, we will refund 100% of what you've given. See, I know God. I trust what he does. Pray on it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And if and when you are ready to do this, let us know. Because we will date the commitment and we will start that 90 day clock. We will help you prepare for the blessings that God will pour out on you. And we will pray with you through this entire process. We're not gonna ever ask you to bring us a paycheck or a bank statement. We trust you. After all, it's not our money anyway, even as a church. If you cheat, that's between you and God. I have nothing to do with that. How much is enough? Idols, possessions, money. Church, if God owns it all, we have no idols. Think about that. God owns it. We don't have an idol. If God owns it all, we don't have possessions. If someone steals something from you, it wasn't yours in the first place. Okay. If something gets broken, okay. Can I tell them the story? Here's the story. I don't know if I shared it last week or not, but when we had the ice storm, my wife was in her mother's driveway, which was steep. Yes, that's the story. She hit ice at the top of the drive and her car started to slide back down. Rebecca said, Mom, you're on the rocks. What Karen didn't realize was the rocks were the boulders. So when Karen came off the end, which was a three and a half foot drop, she ripped off the front part of her car. But you know what? She'll tell you. Rebecca will tell you. When they told me about it, this was the day of the women's conference and the men's conference. I wasn't upset. It can be fixed. It's stuff. The old Jeff, I'd have blown up. I'm just telling you. 
God owns it all. It's okay. If God owns it all, he allows us to keep 90% of what we make. That's more than the federal government. Amen. You bow your heads, please. Father God, thank you for the words that you have chosen to share today. I hope that the message was understood to be a biblical principle. You don't need our money. You don't need anything we have. You are everything. But trusting you, Father, is hard. Fully putting our faith and trust in you is hard. But I ask as you work this week, next week, and for the next years, let people understand that following any principle you have set is the best way to live life. You gave us 10 commandments and Jesus narrowed it down to two, love God, love people, because we know that those two encompass everything else that was, that was taught. Lord, we thank you for your freedom that you give us, for the free will to decide what we will or will not do. Lord, I thank you for the privilege that it is to receive the blessings that you give just to stand here and share your words. As we prepare for communion today, Lord, I ask you to touch the hearts of all those that are here. And with all eyes closed and heads bowed, Father, if there is someone in this room today that feels that they need to get you, to know you closer, to, to have you as their Lord and Savior, I ask you right now to allow that person just to raise their hand where they're at. We're not going to ask them to come down. We don't do that here. We will acknowledge who they are. And Father God, for the rest of us, let us cleanse our hearts and our minds as we enter into your presence to share the meal with you that you have given us to do. So those that are here, if you would, please just repeat after me. Father God, this week I have done things that I shouldn't have done. And I ask you to forgive me. I accept that forgiveness right now. And as I approach your throne with a cleansed heart and a renewed mind, I ask you to give me the strength to endure another week, to be in your presence daily, and to acknowledge you as the giver of all good things. In Jesus' name, amen. Does everybody have communion? If you would, peel back the top and take out the wafer. As we look at this, we this is the bread of life. This represents the body of Jesus. In the upper room, the night before he was betrayed, before he was crucified as our Lord and Savior, he took bread with his disciples. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread and told him, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And every time you do this, remember me. Then Jesus took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he told them, this is my blood. But he went further and said it was the blood of the new covenant, which would be shed for the forgiveness of sins for all men who believe. And he said, each time you drink of this cup, remember me. You bow your heads, please. Father, sharing a meal with you each and every week is such a beautiful thing. And I thank you for allowing those here to partake in the elements, which is you. Lord, I speak blessings upon all those that are here today. I ask you to be with their lives in every aspect of it. I ask you to answer the prayers that they ask. Father God, more importantly, I just ask you to watch over them and 
keep them. Bring them back safely to us next week. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen and amen. If you would, go forth into the world loving God.